Good afternoon, everybody. This is our second week of mental health in the time of coronavirus. I am going to be talking about some exciting things today. And uh, so just as sort of a, uh, as they say, a teaser, I'm going to be talking about a few things. Number one, um, what does a tattoo of oxytocin on a person's foot, uh, polygamous voles, and cocaine-doing rats have in common? Um, that is going to be the question for today's program. So we are going to be uh, going over some exciting material. Um, just as a, another brief review, um, I am Dr. David Carrion. I am a psychiatrist in Silicon Valley, uh, the medical director of Acacia Mental Health and the uh, chief medical officer of Flourish Tech. Um, going to be uh, talking about, we're going to be doing about 35 minutes by viewer request, a little bit longer presentation. Um, then we're going to be doing some uh, questions and answers, um, and then we're going to uh, do some feedback surveys. Um, again, this the audience for this is uh, some of the topics here are a little mature and uh, can be challenging, so uh, viewer discretion is advised. And uh, don't be a jerk in the chat. That uh, continues to be a rule. So, um, we are, our sponsors are Flourish Tech and Acacia Mental Health. Um, so there's uh, people from both those organizations behind the scenes uh, helping put this on. So um, thank you all for tuning in. Now, uh, make sure that you ask your questions. There are uh, links below. So uh, use the uh, links in the, um, in the uh, Q&A below. So flourish uh, bit.ly uh, bit slash flourish tech Q&A. Too, so uh, use that below. All right, where are we now? We've topped 1 million cases of confirmed um, infection. There have been over 60,000 deaths uh, worldwide from this pandemic, and the numbers continue to rise. Uh, the number of people that are infected continue to increase. And so uh, the, the challenges continue. Um, many more people, I've read one number over uh, more than a billion people are sheltering in place and uh, limiting the contact they have with other people. And so this raises a lot of questions about um, what kind of creatures we are and, um, and how can we thrive even though a lot of the things that we've uh, come to depend on and maybe are in our nature are taken away or changed. Um, so... We're going to review a little bit from last week. So um, the construct that I had is basically you want to make sure that you take care of yourself as least as well as you take care of your houseplant. Uh, both you and your houseplant have bodies, and so make sure to feed them and give them lots of light. Um, also, take care of yourself at least as well as you take care of your dog. And so if you happen to have a dog, dogs are great, by the way, if you don't. So um, anyways, uh, there are uh, certain needs that dogs have that plants don't. And then, of course, take care of your soul, those aspects of yourself or your brain that are higher or above or beyond um, what is typical, so um, that a, a dog might have. Now, um, reviewing last week, we talked about nutrition, food, and light. Those life hacks are, uh, number one, uh, don't eat crap. So it's tempting. Uh, there's all sorts of opportunities for high sugar, high deliciousness kinds of things, but uh, don't do it. Try to limit the, um, the food that you can. Give yourself grace if you slip, but focus on um, Mediterranean style diet. In other words, lots of veggies, whole grains, lean meats, and healthy fats. And number two is go outside every now and then. Um, even though you're sheltering in place, and at least in most places, you're allowed to go outside. So go for walks, get lots of sunlight. That's going to help regulate. We're going to talk a little bit more about why that's important um, this week as well. Um, and then lastly, we talked about um, the Blitz spirit. We talked about how uh, Londoners were able to get back to um, their posts despite the fact that um, there was a very good chance, uh, higher than many other times in history, that you might die in the middle of the night uh, from a German bomb. Uh, but they were able to face that and the psychological casualties were few and far between. All right, moving on to today's material. We're talking about brains today, and specifically the part of your brain that is uh, mammalian or similar to, uh, say, something like a dog or a rat. Um, and so those areas are uh, social, uh, our community, um, being able to move around and making sure to sleep. So we're going to start with sleep. Now, some people say they slept like a baby, um, 
and I sometimes interpret that to mean that they woke up every few hours screaming. Um, definitely don't sleep like a baby if you're a grown-up. You should sleep like a grown-up and soundly. But that is a uh, that's that's something that needs to be figured out. How do you sleep well? Uh, well, the the one of the big questions here is um, what exactly is sleep for? Um, so this is one of my favorite comics, XKCD. Uh, humans are defined by our curiosity, our hunger for answers. We spend a third of our lives lying down with our eyes closed and nobody knows why. Yeah, so maybe we don't, we haven't quite figured out everything yet. But um, there has been some interesting progress over the past few years. Um, specifically in 2017, there was a big finding or a confirmation of an idea that one of the major things that sleep does is allows for the toxins that are in your brain to drain. So when you have metabolism, there are uh, waste products of that metabolism that need to be uh, filtered out. And for most of the body, um, daytime activity um, is able to be drained out during the day. But it turns out with the brain, um, there are certain channels that open up only at night when you're asleep that are um, allow you allow those toxins to filter out. So when we talk about like, oh yeah, you know, getting a good night's sleep and why do you feel terrible? Well, there's like literal poison like in your brain when you're not sleeping. So it's, you know, you should sleep. So as best you can. Now, again, this is like, um, you know, there are some ways that we can talk about how to do that. Um, and, uh, but one way is uh, just actually sleeping. Um, so there was a long time uh, discussion back uh, a while ago around, um, is insomnia driven by things like depression or is insomnia uh, a consequence of depression? And so uh, one group decided to address the question by saying, let's just take all of the uh, you know, organic or biologically based insomnia out of it. Let's just focus on people who voluntarily have no problem sleeping if they choose to sleep, but just happen to choose to sleep less. Now, um, raise your hand in the audience. There you go. Yes, you in the back. Um, raise your hand if you've ever not slept voluntarily because of, say, an electronic or, um, you know, uh, scrolling Facebook or Twitter or uh, watching TV or maybe even reading a novel. Basically, you could have slept, but you chose not to. And then you didn't get enough sleep the next day. Raise your hand if you've ever done, yes, we all, we've all done that. Um, but if you're a scientist, that's not good enough. What you need to do is you need to come up with a fancy name for it. Behaviorally Induced Insufficient Sleep Syndrome. So that is, uh, that is the name for just not sleeping enough. Um, but so, that's the um, that's what they they called it. Now, the interesting thing about this particular study that I've got the uh, reference in the bottom there, is that it's uh, actually without these organic causes, suicide rates increase or uh, suicidal ideation increases in the midst of just voluntarily sleeping less. Now, it wasn't a dramatic increase, um, but that sense of life being really difficult, uh, so difficult that it's hard to go on, um, might be the thing that pushes people a little bit further. So. Um, it's painful to not sleep. So, you know, but, but that raised the question of like, okay, great. How do we sleep? Now, this may come as a surprise, but uh, rigor with an alarm clock can go a long way. So if there's one and only one thing you're going to do um, differently, I would say set a regular wake up time. Whatever it is, nine o'clock, eight o'clock, seven o'clock, um, set the alarm clock at that time and don't change it for two weeks. Um, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, if you have things, if you don't have things, wake up at the same time. As we talked about last week, the circadian rhythm, your body loves regularity. Um, it loves you doing things at the same time and especially sleep. Now, why do I say set it at the same time? Because this is an anchor for a lot of the other key sleep messages um, that if you don't catch up on sleep in the morning by sleeping in, this sort of feeds back on bad sleep habits and makes you sleepy at the right time and alert at the right time. Now, here's what I mean about these basic rules. Um, there's a few of them, but the first in the first tip, the first rule here for sleep is get enough sleep, make it a priority. Now I'm going to say it again. No, but really make it a priority. This is like an important time, especially now um, with a lot of our routines being thrown off because of the virus and uh, our schedules changing and things like that, we really need to make it a priority to go to sleep when it's um, when it's right. Again, it's understandable if you uh, want to uh, binge a Netflix series every now and then and uh, stay up super late. Hey, 
that's okay every now and then. Just don't do that all the time. Give yourself grace, give yourself flexibility in this time, but by and large, focus on regular wake up times. Um, and then the other key one here is don't be in bed unless you're sleeping. Now, this is a uh, counterintuitive one, but you want to basically train your brain that bed equals sleep. Um, for people with insomnia, oftentimes bed equals the place you worry about not sleeping. And so that's an anxious trigger. That's something that is anxiety provoking. Um, whereas if you just are in bed for only sleeping and not doing anything else, then um, it's, it's helpful. Uh, don't nap. Um, and then here's the other one. If you're not asleep in 20 minutes, get up. Don't toss and turn in bed. Get up, do something quiet, and uh, when you feel sleepy again, try again. Now, you're going to tell me if you've got insomnia that oftentimes I've tried that and I'm just not going to sleep and then I'm going to have a terrible day tomorrow. Well, you'll only have so many terrible days before your body literally collapses. Um, and that's kind of the goal. We want to have uh, prioritize quality of sleep over uh, attempted quantity of sleep. Um, and then you get the quality, uh, the quantity thrown in. So in other words, if you have three hours of sleep tonight and you try to go to sleep on time tomorrow night, it's going to work. And if it doesn't work tomorrow night, it's going to be the next night. Uh, and that if you keep these rules of not napping and waking up at the same time, um, then that's a spectacular way to get yourself in a good sleep cycle. Uh, don't have your phone in the room when you sleep. Now, okay, phones are uh, pretty bad. They will shoot blue photons into your eyeballs, uh, which are wake-up signals. Um, you don't want to be woken up at, you know, 2 a.m. or midnight or whenever you're going to sleep. Um, and also, if you're using phone for social media, then, like, it's just terrible news about coronavirus right now. So that's also not going to help you sleep. So as best you can, uh, keep your phone away from you uh, when you're falling asleep. Um, don't look at it before bed. And uh, it's another straightforward one, but sometimes people forget. Caffeine has a pretty long half-life, so uh, no caffeine after 1 p.m. And then do other stuff that's good for you, too. Um, so things like exercise and diet and all of that. All of these things feed back on each other. Um, now, these, um, these uh, sleep rules are uh, based on something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. It's the one and only one time in the history of psychiatry um, where a psychotherapy beat a medication. Normally the story goes medications work for depression, psychotherapy works for depression, they both work about about the same, you put them together they work even better. First time in history that I, in a head-to-head -head trial that I'm, that I'm aware of, um, please send me uh, links to studies if you're aware of others, but first time that I'm aware of um, that a um, psychotherapy outcompeted a medication for the same indication, that um, Ambien doesn't work as well as trying to rigorously follow these tips for sleeping. Um, so, any case, that's, uh, that's the, uh, the takeaway here. Okay, you ready for your next life hack? Life hack number four, let the literal poison drain from your brain by sleeping. So, I know these are, these are like kind of mind-blowing, but um, let the poison drain out. Okay, next we're going to be talking about the um, social connection. So humans are social mammals, um, social creatures. Uh, we love being in groups, we love being together. Um, that it's the, uh, the rare person that is a true hermit um, that goes out into the desert. And oftentimes, um, even when people do go out into the desert, it becomes such a uh, celebrated thing that people go out to visit the people who have gone out to the desert or the hermit or the, uh, the isolated one. And that sort of, again, defeats the purpose. But this is a very challenging thing to actually accomplish is, is isolation. And yet this is what we're all being asked to do. Um, so I'm going to go over a few ex uh, classic experiments in human connection. Um, the first one is by uh, Harry Harlow, one of the um, greats of psychology. And apparently back in the 50s, there was a good idea. There was this idea that um, moms had germs on them. And so it'd be much more sanitary if you raised babies in boxes and like didn't actually touch them. Because um, then it'd be cleaner. You wouldn't transmit bacteria back and forth. Um, so uh, Harry Harlow had the idea that, hey, maybe that's not such a good idea. And uh, did that experiment on... Um, monkeys and they did not fare well at all um that that was not healthy that is not i mean again we kind of know that now that it's it's not a good idea to leave babies by themselves in a box without touching them you got to hold them and cradle them and cuddle them um and so um and then also uh 
it's not just the material sustenance. It's not just the milk that the animals want. It's the physical touch. It's even just the soft touch of, uh, in this case, terry cloth was better than um, the one that was providing sustenance. So this is, um, but you know, we're, we're in a place now that we're not able to um, have as much human touch as we normally do. Um, even handshakes, uh, loss of handshakes and hugs and, you know, things like that are, are pretty significant, especially for those who live alone. Um, and why is this? Well, partly because we are creatures that all use oxytocin. So um, the oxytocin is a, a neuroendocrine, um, it's a, it's a hormone that communicates uh, certain things. And namely, it communicates connection and was um, most effectively used in, or uh, commonly used in um, breastfeeding or um, uh, nursing and happens in mammals. But uh, more recently, we're also finding that it's not just in this, um, but it's, uh, it's become the, uh, the love hormone or the cuddle hormone or the, um, the hormone that comes when uh, people are together. So it's, uh, it's, it also comes out with um, human physical contact and human bonding. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a story of two different voles. Um, now, what is a vole? A vole is a small mammal um, pictured here. Um, and uh, this is a prairie vole. This is a montane vole. The prairie vole is a creature that is monogamous. Uh, after mating, the prairie vole will be true and faithful to his partner until he dies. What a gentleman. The, prairie, the, the montane vole is not so gentlemanly. Uh, the montane vole is like um, most creatures in the wild. Uh, there is no attachment or connection after mating. Now, what happens if you block this guy's oxytocin? If you block the, uh, this particular hormone, he is not able to maintain that connection. He doesn't form that bond with his partner um, without the oxytocin. Now, what's even weirder is what happens if you, uh, because it's the sci-fi future, uh, what happens if you inject oxytocin receptors into the pleasure parts of this creature's brain? Well, he becomes monogamous, or at least more monogamous than he was before. Um, and this is uh, an astonishing finding um, that like there are these so what the, the finding was that there are these receptors in the pleasure center that drive certain neural activity um, that change human behavior. And so this is the circuitry that is at least in part or circuitry similar to these creatures um, that is, uh, that's, that's, that's lonely right now or that's not being activated um, with our missing out on um, hugs and handshakes. Um, but humans have also uh, taken this to another level. Um, it's not just the uh, physical touching, it's also um, ritual. It's also uh, human behavior. So uh, this is a one-off, uh, not so scientific, scientific experiment on oxytocin levels at a wedding. So this guy, Paul Zach, went to this wedding and measured the oxytocin of the bride, the groom, the mother of the bride, and like the wedding party. Um, and it turns out that um, the bride's oxytocin was through the roof, higher than anybody else's at the ceremony, and the uh, mother of the bride, I think, was number two. Uh, sadly enough, it was not the husband in this particular case. But all this to say, um, it was a, um, in this particular um, ritual, this behavior, this thing that humans do, um, even without uh, physical contact, um, you're seeing drastic changes in um, oxytocin. Um, so, um, and here's another story. So, okay, so uh, this is uh, this one comes from uh, evolutionary biology. Why is it that humans have such big brains? Uh, what do we do with those big brains? Why do those uh, big brains um, develop? And um, so uh, one story is that, oh, we needed big brains for tools. Um, but another story is, well, we needed those big brains because of group size. So if you correlate the number of, uh, the mean group size of a particular group of um, monkeys or apes, the bigger their group, the larger their brain. In other words, it might be that you need to have a big brain to manage all of the complex social relationships that your group entails. Um, it's critical for a chimpanzee to know exactly where in the um, hierarchy he is and that uh, keeping track of, well, who defeated who in the most recent uh, conflict and who's on top and who's on bottom um, really allows for the group to exist and exist in a way that's more um, complex and effective than if they were just uh, individual uh, creatures. Uh, but maybe this um, on 
theories of evolutionary biology is what is driving um, driving the bus. Um, but that also brings up the point about our um, our group size and uh, how this is a very important part of who we are when we think about um, when we think about how we interact with each other, um, how we behave, how we uh, connect. Um, we have rather large groups. We have lots of uh, um, strong, close connections, but also distant connections. Um, and this also can be a reminder for us to reach out to some of those more distant connections, um, who in our group of, say, a few hundred that we have some connection with, um, could we reach out to um, this week? Who is somebody that might be lonelier than we are? Um, who's somebody that uh, we've, we haven't talked to in a while and might want to send a note to? Um, all right, so the next thing we're going to talk about is cocaine. Um, because I'm sure that's all why you're here. Um, so this is an experiment on rats. Now, one of the, uh, the, the great things about, um, one of the great things about science and about, uh, rat experiments is all of these great classic, you know, this is your brain on drugs, you know, getting a bunch of animals addicted to all sorts of terrible drugs. And we learned a lot about the, you know, neurobiology of addiction because of that. But one of the things that's, uh, not often, um, uh, one of the backgrounds of these experiments is that, it's, it's actually kind of hard to get a rat addicted to cocaine, um, believe it or not. Or rather, it's hard to get a rat in a, uh, a, a rat that is flourishing, a rat that is in a good environment. And so um, this is a study showing that uh, explicitly, but also trying to understand the neuroscience underneath it. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the cage on the right, um, that is the like ideal paradise for rats. You've got lots of other rats. You've got like, uh, you've got a ladder you can climb up to, to nowhere, but I guess rats like that. You've got a wheel, um, all sorts of stuff that rats are totally into. And if you look at the number of times when after they, uh, they sort of lived their life in this, um, in this environment, uh, you give them free access to cocaine and, um, they don't press the lever very much. Um, that third bar there, um, there's not much activity. Um, but if you decrease that, if you just have them, you take away all the, t the fun and games, you but you do give them a social environment, that middle cage, um, they still use a fair amount of cocaine, uh, but not nearly as much as if they're alone and isolated. And so this is fascinating because what happens when you are alone and isolated? It's um, and this last, uh, these last three pictures are pictures of activity in the amygdala. Um, the amygdala is a part of the brain that's involved in uh, fear and uh, fear and strong emotion. And the rats in that bottom, um, in that, that first one on the left, showed lots of those little uh, brown speckles. Um, the amygdala was going crazy when they were, um, when this was checked. Um, in, other in other words, they were very anxious just by being alone. Whereas if you had a roommate, they had less. Whereas if you had like a flourishing rat life, um, the amygdala wasn't really needed, that they were doing okay. There wasn't a threat. Now, why is that important? Well, um, social mammals from rats to chimpanzees to humans, when we're isolated, when we're lonely, it means that we're about to die. So um, if you were in a um, ancient, uh, ancient situation, if you were a, um, a chimpanzee on your own, then if you were alone and you're apart from your troop, you're about, you're, you're, your life, you're not long for this world. Um, you're about to be dead. And so you've got a, you know, your brain has this pain signal. Like if you have your hand on a hot stove, it's a pain signal to move your hand. If you're a chimpanzee in the wild and lost, uh, you need to like figure out how to get back. Same with humans. Um, and so we have this sense, this sense of uh, anxiety and sometimes we call it loneliness. Um, and so there has been an, increasing amount of research on specifically loneliness. Why are we, um, why do we, uh, what does it mean when somebody is lonely and what is the, what are the consequences in the brain and with health? Um, so uh, one thing that they found uh, recently, this was a, a preprint that was put out on um, March 27th. So this is like brand new. Um, it looks like uh, uh, parts of the midbrain that are involved in craving are also involved in craving social connection. Um, and so you put people ice in an isolation room for a day, and then you show them pictures of people hanging out, and they have cravings in a similar way that you have food cravings if you fast for those uh, same 10 hours. Um, so, uh, but this this also goes to show that uh, loneliness is, is almost like a, um, uh, that it sort of shares neurocircuitry, um, that some of the things that are true of 
uh, some appetites like food are also true of social. Um, but not just that, it also increases your risk of death. So there is no clear outcome in my mind of health than being alive or dead. And for people who, even in some of these very simple measures of just asking, do you feel lonely? And here's a scale, one to 10. And just that subjective question, even one, um, goes a long way to predicting um, all cause mortality. In other words, even after you adjust for people's uh, weight and people's diabetes status and all of these other things, it turns out that loneliness is itself a risk factor for dying, let alone um, mental health. So um, one more thing on this, this is, uh, this is work that um, me and a couple other guys, uh, Roy Baumeister and Brad Wright, um, put together some years ago. But um, the idea, uh, we, we, we tried to measure um, willpower or uh, ego depletion or uh, the sort of uh, state of being fatigued when you're trying to make a decision. Um, and uh, it turns out that sleep is one of the best ways uh, that when you sleep poorly, the next time you, we ask you whether or not you're depleted, you're much more likely to say yes, which makes sense. But so too with interpersonal conflict. If you've had a fight with your spouse or friend or whoever it is, you're much more likely to have been um, depleted at the end of that than before. And so, but these two things work together. Um, the more you're depleted, the less, the more likely it is that you're going to uh, have a fight, or the more likely it is that you're going to, um, you know, binge a series. Uh, the more likely you are to stay up late later than you should. Um, and so in all of these things, uh, it's important to identify when you are in one of these depleted states and, uh, and try to recognize that and say, okay, well, geez, I really need to uh, reconcile with my partner. I really need to make sure I get a good night's sleep tonight. Um, and then, um, so the last thing in this, in this area is, uh, this is something I found on uh, Instagram. It's okay to grieve. So a lot of things that we took for granted, a lot of things that we just knew we couldn't miss, like a wedding or our freedom or a stable check or a graduation. These are all things that we knew were going to happen. They're part of our, our stability, but it's okay to grieve. Um, it's okay to be sad and um, mourn for these losses that are, that are enormous. Um, you know, one person uh, not being able to have a, a wedding ceremony as he or she dreams is sad, but you know how many countless people are having to have that experience right now um, that their dreams are being changed in all of these major ways. So um, it's okay to grieve. Um, and then um, afterwards, look for ways to move forward. Look for ways to, to actually make those connections, to replace those things that are lost. And I think that's one of the things that I've been most inspired by. The, uh, the rise of uh, humans' creativity to connect in ways that are new and different. Um, I've been on more uh, Zoom, uh, Zoom meals and Bible studies and birthday parties and uh, you know patient visits that we've uh, used technology in some ways to, uh, to fill this gap. We've been able to connect across these platforms. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, churches are, uh, churches and other institutions are adapting. Uh, here's a, uh, here's a, uh, drive-in church is becoming a thing in some places. Um, and, uh, but there's also, there's countless things. There's drive-by birthday parties for, uh, I, I, uh, read about an older woman that was not able to have a birthday party because, uh, you know, risks of infection, but, um, they just had all the friends and family drive by and greet her from the road. Um, we've had a, uh, 7 PM essential worker celebrations, people in cities around the world erupting in celebration, uh, together clapping or singing about, um, celebrating those people who are coming back from work. Um, socially distanced hiking. Um, yes, you're, you're more than six feet away from the people you're hiking with and, um, you know, trying to mitigate risks that way. Uh, Netflix watch parties, watching movies together, playing board games together, even though they're not on the board, um, having meals together. It's been an incredible time of, uh, innovation around connecting. So life hack number, uh, five, spend time with people, spend time with people. Um, you're a, uh, you're, you're, you are a social creature. Um, that's part of your brain. It's part of your makeup. And, uh, even if you are an introvert, making sure to have time and space, uh, to connect with other people, um, is, um, is important. All right. Um, so again, uh, we're going to go over some of the rest of these, uh, next week, uh, specifically movement or action. 
um, but that is for your brain. Um, I'm going to go over some, uh, here's, uh, here's philosophy corner for this week. Um, this is, um, so this is, this is a time that's also very interesting, right? We're, we're not moving around as much as we used to. Um, we're not, uh, in some, uh, for many people, we're not as busy as we used to be. We have a lot more time. Now, this raises some very interesting questions about what kinds of creatures we are. Um, do we like this? Is this okay with us? Or are we going, you know, is this, is this boredom um, driving us crazy? Um, this is, but this is um, a, a quote from um, one of the, uh, the, the just a, a brilliant thinker, a, a guy named um, Pascal, um, a French thinker. He wrote... I have discovered that all the unhappiness of men arises from one single fact, that they cannot stay quietly in their own chamber. And he goes on to describe like how many just terrible events occurred because people were just, they couldn't just sit in their room. They had to go start a war or they had to go on some disastrous adventure or they had to go, you know, sue somebody or they had, you know, so just imagining all of these things that people do that if they were just content with peace and quiet, they wouldn't do. Um, and so, but why aren't we content with peace and quiet? That when we still our mind, what's there? Um, what comes up when there is no um, buzz, when there is no uh, infinite scroll, when there is no binging series? Um, and we might not like the answer. And this is one of the, the sort of deep challenges of being human is that for, it's not common for that to be a pleasant experience. In fact, so much so that, um, but it's also ironic that one of the greatest things you could do for a, uh, a saint is give him solitude. One of the worst things you could do to a prisoner is give him solitude. And so this is, um, this is a fascinating um, uh, question. Um, and so, but this is a, also, this is a, a Taoist proverb, um, often attributed to uh, Lao Tzu, but uh, you know, in the sort of uh, internet citation era, I was not able to find a reliable source saying that this was actually from him. Um, but in any case, to a mind that is still, the whole universe surrenders. And so I think this, this, this question of, of stillness can we slow our minds down? Um, can we be at can we be at peace? And I think that from a um, high level, let's just we can give ourselves again grace if we are needing to binge a series, if we're needing to watch or you know read a book and just uh, escape or play a video game. But make sure during this time, during this crisis, to spend time quiet and alone. And intentionally so. And so, um, and then uh, one more, this is from the Gospel of Luke. But now even more, the report about Jesus went, went ab abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. So we have um, another story of another um, another incredible person who is taking the time intentionally. Not that um, in this account, not that Jesus had nothing to do. He was very busy. He was doing all sorts of good healing work, but he would also withdraw to desolate places. And so in that sense, maybe, yeah, I've, much as I've said, uh, you know, go outside and go for a walk and be active, um, maybe go outside and sit someplace for an hour. Uh, maybe stay inside, ask your family or, um, or people for, you know, put your phone on silence and, and sit there for a while and uh, just meditate or pray. Um, I think it's uh, especially as we're having to reckon with what the future holds for us as individuals and what the future holds for us as uh, a society, we're going to need to be very reflective about ourselves and what kind of a society we've built and what sort of a society we want to return to when the time comes for us to emerge from our shelter in place. But um, we have a great opportunity and we uh, shouldn't squander it. All right. So that's enough uh, philosophy for now. We are going to move now into the, uh, the Q&A. So please do remember um, 
I'm going to uh, uh, go through the uh, questions that have been submitted online as well as questions that have been submitted in the chat. Um, so please go to the survey and we're going to um, answer some of those questions in a few seconds. All right, we are back and now it's time for Q&A. Here's my lovely wife, <laughs> Abigail, and she's gonna moderate again. Hi everybody. It's, uh, it's really interesting to think about uh, the differences of quarantine experience for people as the weeks progress. You know, maybe, maybe some people were really into it the first couple weeks, but now it's like week three or week four for some, and so it's starting to, I don't know, uh, affect people differently um, and and so some of the questions are reflecting some of these these changes um, so just to, to dive on in here um, there are questions about what if you don't feel like you have more time um, in many ways I feel busier more occupied mentally and emotionally besides setting aside time are there any other practical ways to ensure we make margin for ourselves to slow our minds down, um, you know, and to actually reckon with some of this stuff. Um, it seems to be pretty thematic that people are not necessarily feeling like the time is free or that they have energy to create or innovate because the energy is absorbed into like, you know, the process of just survival or, you know, uh, some of the obligations and exhaustions of this new way of life. Yeah, no, I think that's that's certainly uh, something that at least I personally am more in the boat of. That um, you know our our work has not slowed down. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so it's uh you know it's uh but I think that it's it's all the more important when it is difficult when things are busy um, to set time aside. Mm -hmm. And I know for me it's it's been a critical part of my own um, maintaining my own. Uh, mental and spiritual health to set Sundays aside as a day of rest. Um, and so, you know, figuring out ways that you are um, rigorous and vigorous about uh, defending a corner of your schedule, um, whether mm. it be a, a time in the morning or a time in the evening or um, one day a week or something like that. But, but um, yeah, and at the same time, um, as I'll say, I think giving grace in this time to yourself is also important. We are going through a lot. And so um, if you're, you know, um, for Christians, if your quiet time isn't perfect, or if your uh, your mind is scattered because of all the things that are going on, that's, that's okay. Um, but, you know, the, always ask the question, what do, how can I do better tomorrow? Uh, how can I do something better next week that I didn't do this week? Um, and, you know, not needing to beat mm. up on yourself if you aren't perfect. Oh, that's really helpful. Um, and then on the other, on the other hand, we have, I don't know, for, for me, I've really enjoyed being alone <laughs> in a lot of the moments uh, throughout this time. And for others, um, you know, is there a time that the enjoyment of solitude shifts to loneliness and we may not understand that that's what's happening or that like, oh, it's not that I'm just continuing to be really introverted. I just, I'm actually depressed. Um, you know, is there, is it subjective, this, this experience of loneliness with what's going on right now? Or, um, is it, is it the case that some people just really might be cool with being a hermit? <laughs> yeah, no, this is, I think also a, a, a under researched question, um, because a lot of these things correlate, um, in ways that are hard to separate. Um, so people who are, uh, loneliness correlates with depression, 
um, and lack of, um, and, and also correlates with um, people's being uh, physically alone. Um, but which is, which is causing which? Um, it's not entirely easy to say. But, but yeah, I think that it is very important to, um, to try to monitor that as best you can um, in yourself. Um, am I not connecting to people because it's just too exhausting? Um, that sounds more mm. like a depressing, a, a depressive symptom. Um, and again, maybe subthreshold. Maybe it's not you don't maybe not having major depressive disorder, but um, yeah. as opposed to um, I am so thoroughly enjoying myself um, in you know these solitary activities, then um, that I don't really want to spend more time with people. You know, those are those mm -hmm. are entirely different. Um, drives, but again, it's it's often they're mixed, and it's it's hard to tell. Um, I would also look at um, other aspects of life. You know, are you you know, uh, are, have there been changes in sleeping? Have there been changes in eating? Have there been changes in um, energy and mood? Have you been sad? Have you been crying more than usual? Um, again, all these things don't necessarily mean that you have depression, um, but those would be those are um, if it's unclear in one domain around depression. Um, sometimes it's it's uh, clear in the others. Mm. Yeah, and looking looking forward to um, you know how we'll all be back together again, if you will. <laughs> um, maybe things won't ever really feel like back to normal, and so you know it's just to practice social distancing and all these different measures um, for the next few months or you know, kind of, you know, watching how that is supposedly helping flatten the curve and all these things, the long-term trajectory of, you know, the next year, you know, all through the fall, next, the year after that, you know, how are social experiences going to change from that? And like, what do we do with, uh, maybe, um, people are feeling some anxiety about how social interactions may have already been anxiety provoking and then social interactions that have been changed by some externalizing, you know, event, externalized event that has now made it so, so much more effective, you know, like what kinds of tips do you have to speak to that sort of like, um, anticipation of, I don't know what the new normal is going to be in our society or if we're, any of us are going to like it or to what extent are some of these, um, these changes going to stick around and how permanent they are and all the different concerns that go along with that. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, in, in some sense, it's, it's a potentially very exciting time because a lot of these, um, norms that we've, we've made are, uh, up for grabs. Like, do I really have to be at the office five days a week for mm -hmm. eight hours? Like, no, no, you did, you never had to be that way. Mm -hmm. And so now that we've proven that you never had to be that way, we get to now sort of, um, we get to we get to have a choice, and so I think that um, you know th these are these are things that we get to participate in and think about, like um, with whatever it is, which of these temporary measures do we want to make permanent? Um, what are the changes that we want to make? And again, I think this gets back to the solitude and quiet thing. Just really thinking, um, whether it's in small ways uh, of you know your friend group or in big ways of your country, um, what sort of a world do you want? this to be in six months? Um, what things do we want to change? Uh, what things do we want to stay the same and go back to how they were? Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, just thinking about this, like I was thinking about culturally, you know, there's siestas, like the afternoon naps for several hours where it's like everyone just closes up shop for a little bit and everyone goes home for a few hours. And uh, I was thinking about my own habits and ways that I would disappoint you, uh, my husband and a doctor who advises against naps um, I'm horrified. I'm horrified. I love naps. I love naps. I live and thrive by taking naps of various lengths at various times and when it, you know, and I can sleep fine for the hours that I am asleep, like at night. So anyway, there were some questions that came in regarding the nap situation. And as everything else is happening so much, like maybe that's your escape. Maybe that's your coping skill. Maybe that's, it's, it's like, okay, there's nothing else to do. Or maybe it's, you know. Maybe that's, maybe that's my genuine hobby. <laughs> um, <laughs> and if I don't have insomnia, can I ignore your no napping rule? And if so, like if we are taking naps, what would you say are good lengths amount of time, you know, to, to try to get naps and what kinds of uh, ways can different kinds of naps help? And at what time of day should you take them? If you are going to be a napper. 
which I approve of, even if he doesn't. <laughs> so um, the, the napping thing is a very um, interesting domain because like, okay, so these, these recommendations were developed around um, trying to treat people with insomnia. So yeah, um, in a sense that the, they're most applicable if people are having problems sleeping um, or having trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, um, things like that. Um, so that said, this is the, um, these are the, the best uh, general guidelines for maintaining high quality sleep. Um, and in a time when there is less activity outside, is it going to be overall best for our brains to be napping in the middle of the day rather than say going for a walk or doing something else? Now again, full, full, totally allowed to have grace for yourself or even just permanently like i'm going to allow myself uh, i will permanently give myself grace <laughs> this is like <laughs> regarding you know, naps uh you know it's it's recommended that you floss you don't have to floss uh like you know that this is this sort of a thing so um but the other thing i think is that is um thought provoking is about um the, the siesta or the afternoon um early afternoon nap that this is um, there are some cultures and places that have this incorporated as a part of their um, their normal circadian rhythm. Um, and so I do think that is under-researched mm. and um, may well be a thing. So uh, in general, um, shorter naps are, are better. The um, 40 minutes or less is going to be the, um, the optimum amount, uh, duration of napping if you are going to nap. Um, but again, if, this is, if sleep is not your problem and you love napping, um, it's mm. not the... You know, it's it's not uh, necessarily the worst thing. Yeah. And then uh, there was another question regarding really enjoying reading in bed or reading right before bedtime. Um, reading helps make you drowsy maybe for some folks. And mm -hmm. so um, when you said make the bed such that, like, that's what your brain connects with sleep, what about if you're a read-in-bed type of person? What would you recommend regarding that? Um, I'd recommend reading in a chair next to bed. Um that is, you know, but it, it, the, these are relatively subtle connections, but they can, they can really have a, a strong feedback. Um, so if the, the bed can more tightly become the place that you are asleep and as much as you can, you can separate those things, um, the, the better. Now, again, gotcha. if you're like, have no problems at all sleeping and your sleep is amazing and you read in bed, like, you know, more power to you. Um, but for those people who are having trouble sleeping or that, um, that especially in this time when, uh, the sleep routines are being, you know, thrown out the window. Um, these are, these are tips to help with, um, improve sleep. Mm -hmm. And then aside from just sort of the, yeah, pragmatics of sleep and eat and just the survival of the animals, like, you know, we're also relation, relational, like you said, we're social and and so many of us have completely different contexts of, of uh, where we're sheltering in place and what our relationships and situations are within that space. And so even if otherwise you would be okay, um, the shelter in place could can cause a lot of um, detachment of, yeah, maybe no desire for self-care, no sleep, uh, everything is a chore, complete exhaustion, maybe you know, conflict relationally, all these sorts of things. Would you have any advice for the situations uh, in which people are s struggling in these ways. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I think making small changes day by day, um, and waking up tomorrow. I think, uh, like I said last week doing, um, everybody can always do something to feel a little bit less miserable. Mm -hmm. So if you're very miserable right now, then the good news about being very miserable is that there's probably lots of things you could do. Um, and that's, that's of course good and bad news, but you know, pick mm -hmm. something. Um, if you're too tired to go for a walk, then, um, you know, just walk, uh, you know, if you can't, if you can't go for a five mile walk, go for a walk around the block. Um, if you mm -hmm. can't, uh, you know, keep to these, uh, you can't turn Facebook off. Well, you know, limit it to, you know, an hour a day, um, put a timer on it or something. So, um, making, making small changes day by day, um, and uh, again, or of course, if you are feeling especially bad or down or depressed, um, then it certainly, you know, doctors are still open. Um, and so it's certainly, you know, not, it wouldn't be a surprising time to develop depression if you hadn't had it before or have it be, mm. um, you know, come back or get worse. So um, you might be able to go back to your uh, therapist or 
um, psychiatrist if you have one or, um, yeah. or think about somebody if it, if it is getting too severe. And speaking of, you know, medical staff, how are, one of the questions that kind of came in is concerning how are you taking care of yourself and at your staff? How are you taking care of you know, yourselves mentally and physically during what we know is obviously right. Like it doesn't slow down for medical staff. So with mm -hmm. your clinic, as well as with Stanford health, uh, you know, any of the things that you're doing there, what have you noticed, um, you and your colleagues have been able to do to take care of yourselves? Well, in some sense, I think that we're, um, there are some, uh, privileges in that come with the, the, the risk. So, um, we do have to be around each other in the hospital and we do have to be around each other um, for providing um, TMS. Um, but that also means that unlike everybody else who has to, who has to social distance, uh, we get to hang out with folks um, in the course of doing our work. And again, we're trying to, um, as best we can, stick to the um, social distancing, um, not having face-to-face -face time with patients when it can be, a, when it can be uh, converted to teletherapy. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, so, so staying connected socially to each other is one thing, you know. Uh, having hangouts after work on Zoom was uh, something we did just last night, and it was, uh, it was a blast, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, and then also uh, trying to, uh, again, this is challenging, but um, trying to stick to our own boundaries um, or make boundaries as best we can. And in emergency or triage situations, then yeah, I know doctors are definitely, I think it's a noble thing to um, give up those typical boundaries and uh, make sacrifices. But um, for the time, we've been able to, I think, do fairly well at um, keeping keeping to regular work and regular sleep and regular hangout social time with each other. Yeah. Oh, that's really great. Um, concerning some of the ways that social socializing has shifted, um, somebody asked, you know, what are the what are ways that you think are best to keep in touch with friends or people from church or people from uh, work who don't have internet. Um, so I actually like had a part of an answer for that is like, I'm enjoying writing like handwritten old school letters. Um, that's interesting. I feel like, I don't know if that would be really cool to receive, give or receive in this time, Maybe like a handwritten letter and just like phone calls. Or, I don't know. Yeah. I'm really enjoying just walk and talks on the phone. Yeah. Telephones are great. You can go for a walk. Uh, this is something you, you, know, you, you may have done before, but yeah, yeah. Uh, have both of you go for a walk and call each other. Um, yeah. and you know, it's, um, these cell phones are amazing things. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, using, um, sort of, I don't know, reverting, uh, to older technologies yeah. is uh, perfectly good. And, um, you know, a lot of that connection can be maintained through these other, um, through these other methods. Yeah. And, um, as far as there's some questions about just, um, you know, the, the anticipated recession because of this and how already unemployment and rates of uh, calls to suicide prevention hotlines, all these things are already skyrocketing. And so we can anticipate it's just the beginning of that, you know, as more as more is happening and we see more uh, unveiling or rollout of um, what's happening with this virus as it ravages communities across the globe. Mm -hmm. How do we navigate, you know, different fear of the future? Maybe you've, for those who've never had too much fear of the future until this sort of um, externalized, externalized event, um, what kinds of ways can we uh, shift that emotion or deal with that emotion? Well, I, I think uh, letting it letting it be for a second is uh, maybe the first thing to do. It's uh, yeah, I mean, mm. this is this is a a critically important time to reflect on, um, yeah, reflect. I think for some people, this is the first time they've thought about, well, geez, maybe I, maybe I could die. Maybe I could be one of the victims, um, or you know, maybe my, uh, you know, business is gonna isn't gonna do so well, or maybe these things. So, you know, really um, sitting in that that anxiety and fear, and then, um, but then also trying to ask, um, how do you? How do we deal with uncertainty? And I think this this inevitably gets to our worldview or life philosophy. Um, how do we how do we deal with the future? Um, for Christians, the story is that you know God's got it, and trusting that in the very end, everything will work out for the good. Um, if you're an existentialist, um, it's well, this too is uh, 
meaningless, but that mm-hmm. can be enjoyed and uh, rolled with anyways. So, um, yeah, I think I think this is going to force us to get both philosophical, but also practical. Like, um, yeah, there there is likely to be um, some kind of recession. So, how do we respond? Um, in what position we're in? Um, if it's you know, if our own business has been hurt, how do we, um, you know, how do we with grace uh, adjust to lower income or having to lay off staff? If we are being laid off, how do we adjust to a world where there might not be as many jobs next month as there are this month? Um, how do we, you know, try to do well, provide for our families? How do we care for people? I mean, these are huge questions. Um, but I do think that this forces us, and it's a, again, it's an opportunity that we shouldn't miss um, to really reflect on it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we, we, in some sense, all know that we're going to die eventually, but yeah, but you know, maybe it's going to be this year. For you know, for unfortunately, for a lot of people, it's going to be this year. I mean, I guess that was already true, but um, but then so too with um, with the financial stuff. Yeah, we thought we were secure, but you know, maybe we're not as secure as we thought. So reflecting on these deeper questions is my advice um i we're as we're wrapping up i mean we'll have one one final question that you know going along the lines of if this virus uh situation drags on for months or even up to a year and like sheltering in place increases um there's different ways that people have over manifest anxiety uh because of their age group or you know the and uh life life season if you will um and so how do how do we deal with that as the the situation continues um especially for the middle school and teenagers uh, sort of age age range where they look to social circles to form their identity um and so kinds of you know what kinds of uh th- social effects do you think that that will have um on the development of the of the generation that's coming up and and any final last note well, I think this gets back to that question um, that was asked earlier of the um, how is this going to change society more broadly? And I mean, you know, one we didn't talk about much today was, um, you know, uh, I've, uh, homeschooling or uh, some people call it COVID schooling. Um, that yeah, we're, we're mm-hmm. having to adju- we're having to make adjustments, and we're spending a lot more time with our our actual you know biological families. Um, that's the safest thing to do is. You know, um, many people in one house now all working in their, at their own things at different corners of the house is, is a now common experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, okay, so, you know, middle schoolers are still going to be influenced. It's just going to be, you know, if this continues, likely more from, um, from family and less from friends um, would be my prediction. Um, but, you know, there have been plenty of times in history mm-hmm. that that's, that, you know, the... Uh, connection to nuclear family um, was stronger and that that and the amount of time spent at home in the home um, was higher and so it seems like that's where we're we're moving into but yet in a world of you know technology so it'll be interesting to see where that um, what long-term consequences that has yeah like maybe social fabric will change but it won't tear completely it's just gonna yeah reset uh, so thank you so much for tuning in for the for the Q and A, everybody, and uh, Dr. Carrion. Thank you so much for yeah. this. And as we as we wrap up for the survey part, yeah. Yeah. So um, we're going to be uh, shifting to the uh, survey now. Um, so this is the um, the final survey. So if you would please give us your feedback, we do take it very seriously. We read it all. So please, if you could, um, in the link below. Um, at the in the video description, fill out the uh, follow-up survey and uh, let us know what you thought of uh, this session and as well as uh, things we could do uh, different or better uh, in the next uh, the next one. The next one is going to be on the uh, 11th, April 11th at 2 p.m. Now, what is next week? We're going to be talking about exercise. We're going to be talking about the effects of uh, physical exercise on the body and uh, why it's such a good idea. And we're going to be spending a lot more time going deep. Um, Beauty, truth, and goodness. How do we, uh, how do we tend to those sides of ourself that are more than just um, the, uh, the, the, the more than just things we share in common with 
um, rats and dogs and, <laughs> and things voles. like that and voles. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Random voles. They'll never They're the best. The voles, voles are the best. Um, but yeah, so uh, th- that's what we're going to be uh, talking about next week. And uh, thank you so much for joining us on um, this latest uh, live stream. So uh, please also stay connected. Uh, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, the uh, Our two... Um, groups that are helping put this on and uh, get the word out. This is uh, this is going to be going on for another couple of weeks. And so uh, please uh, share with your friends and family. Um, thanks and see you next week.